Aloha and mahalo for joining me for another Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Today we get to hear stories from senior federal judge Sam King. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Samuel P. King is the son of a Hawaii governor, and he's lived a life of public service. His father, Samuel Wilder King, served in the U.S. Navy during two world wars and as delegate to the U.S. Congress and as governor of the territory of Hawaii. Judge King is now in his 90s, and he's still a working judge, still hearing cases. In 1997, he found time to co-author a lightning rod newspaper essay with three other highly regarded Hawaiians and a law professor. The essay, Broken Trust, charged gross incompetence and massive trust abuse by the trustees of what was once called the nation's wealthiest charity, Bishop Estate, responsible for the Kamehameha schools. More recently, King and law professor Randall Roth wrote a book with new details of unchecked power. It occurs to me that you've grown up in the hallways, the corridors of power. Your dad was a naval officer and then he was an elected office holder. He was the territorial governor. He, maybe that's why you're so comfortable with power. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I think I owe a lot of that to my mother who made sure that we kept our feet on the ground. And uh, she taught us we were just as good as anybody. And people who had power never bothered me. Uh, I guess I never ran into negative power where they did really do something to me that I didn't want to have happen. That just never happened to me, so I was lucky. And Hawaii it was a very good place to grow up. So we moved out to uh, Holly Cole, which was across the street from where the cemetery is now, on the way to Kaneohe, and we lived there. I grew up there. It was just a wide open spaces, and Kaneohe Bay is such a beautiful place. The, the family, we were in the line of inheritance from Mokapu. In fact, when the Army, when the Air Force and the Navy or the Marines, whoever it was, came along, they condemned it. The King family wound up owning a couple when the intermediate people died. I think we got 75000 for it. <laughs> when you were a little kid, uh, did you have to choose between your Hawaiian heritage and, and, and the Caucasian side? Was that ever an issue? No, but I, we had more Hawaiian influence. My uh, mother's brothers uh, had formed a Hawaiian group themselves, just when they went with the National Guard to mainland and so forth. So my Uncle Tom played the steel guitar. He took the steel guitar to South America. And then my Uncle Doc played the uh, ukulele and Uncle Connie played the ukulele and Uncle Luther played the guitar. So uh, we used to have, at least once a week, we'd have a gathering and they'd all play music and sing Hawaiian. Both of Sam King's parents were part Hawaiian. The family traveled extensively to follow their father's naval career, which is how Sam King happened to be born in China. Once the family returned to Hawaii, King attended Central Grammar and Punahou School, then went to Yale University. He earned a law degree from Yale as well. When I came back, let's see what happened. Of course, I went to work for the Attorney General and in the Land Department, and then for in the city and county of Honolulu. I was a prosecutor at the city county of Honolulu. There were only three of us when Pearl Harbor happened and the military took over. So we didn't have a job. So then I applied to go back in the, to go into the Navy, which is a little bit of a problem because I only have one eye. Why do you only have, you have a glass eye, right? How come? Well, it's plastic now, it used to be glass. I got a little piece of steel in it when I was about six years old. I can't tell which eye it is. <laughs> okay. It's the one with the emo emotion. <laughs> 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 I always said the, the, the story about the, the banker. You look into his face, it's, it's the banker with the glass eye. The one with the emotion is the glass <laughs> eye. <laughs> At any rate. And you know, the Lord did that. Because if he hadn't done that, I would have gone to Annapolis 
and my class would have been the one on those cruises that got sank, sunk in uh, the bay off of uh, Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And so luckily I, I survived that. So after the, when, when we got bombed in 1940, I applied to go back in the Navy, but I had to go to Washington to get a uh, deferment for this because they were taking anybody into things that didn't need uh, two eyes. In fact, I don't need two eyes anyway. <clears throat> and uh, I got a waiver and was put in. I, they wanted to put me in the legal end. I said, no, no, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. So I was in naval intelligence. And they sent me to New Orleans after training. Well, New Orleans, you didn't know what was on. Then I got up all nav, they say, had notice that they wanted people to study Japanese. Well, I'd gone to Japanese school here, Hongwaji Mission in, uh, on Fort Street. So I knew a little Japanese, so I, bo I boned up. And I went to Washington and got interviewed. And uh, the, the expert who was clearing us, he handed me number one a book. They, we used Naganuma, one to 12 or whatever it was. He handed me number one. And he said, read the f first sentence. Well, I don't know if he did that on purpose, but he gave it to me the wrong way. So I turned it over uh -huh. and opened it from the back, you know. I kept going until I found the first sentence. And I could read katakana, which was in katakana. So the kore wa kanji desu. So it had to be, <laughs> this is a book, you know. So I said, kore wa hon desu. I was on my way. <laughs> And that was to be fateful because that's where you met the woman who would become your wife. That's right. <laughs> Anne was in Washington, D.C. after she graduated from Smith working for the Army. And she found that a little boring. So she applied for this. So she goes and sees the same guy that <laughs> came to me. Well, she, she, she had to be about this close t to see. She wore very thick glasses. So they took her glasses off and said, you know, read the chart. So she walked up to it about this far. <laughs> Hey, I have you. Oh, well, he said, do it. You're Phi Beta Kappa? Yes. Uh, what did you study? Greek. You're in. <laughs> so tell me about um, that uh, first meeting and what happened. Well, I was the only person that wound up at Boulder who was already an officer. So I was a Lieutenant JG. So they thought I'd been sent there as a spy, actually. And... Um, so when the waves came in, I was assigned to drill them in Japanese, you know. <laughs> Migi, Muki, me. <laughs> a, so uh, she was in the, the group. She looked good going and coming. So I proposed in two weeks, and she said, Ma, which is a Japanese word for he heaven forbid. You know? She said, ask me again Wednesday. This was a Sunday. So I did, and she accepted. How did you know? How did you know that would be your, should well, be your life mate? She was a uh, Phi Beta Kappa graduate. I, I was looking for, and she was nearsighted. <laughs> <laughs> now she doesn't wear those glasses anymore. And that's what I wanted, brains and beauty. <laughs> Sam and Ann King have been married since 1942, and they have three children. After the war, King went into private practice and later made the move from lawyer to judge. Appointed to the state's First Circuit and Family Courts and U.S. District Court, Sam King presided over highly publicized cases like the notorious double murder on Palmyra Island and the conviction of reputed syndicate crime leader Wilford Nappy Pulava on income tax charges. Despite the seriousness of the issues, Judge King could generally be counted on to bring a little levity to proceedings. You know, I didn't see you in court until you were a federal judge. Um, and I know as a reporter who covered courts that you were the judge people wanted to cover at that time because you would make these wry remarks. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you, you were so comfortable in that courthouse and backed by law, and it was yeah. just, um, it, was, it was fun to see justice take place. <clears throat> Judicial humor has got to be very carefully used. I never used it at the <clears throat> expense of the parties or their lawyers. 
because that's a no-no. It's serious business to them. So when I was able to make a wisecrack, it was about something else. As a judge of character as, and a, a federal judge, do you size people up pretty quickly in court? Not too quickly. I give them the benefit of the doubt. But are you usually right with your first impression? Uh, usually. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to be a judge? You were a lawyer. Well, that's an interesting point. <clears throat> Bill Quinn was governor. And, and he was, in fact, he was the governor after your dad was governor, right? Yes. And he was the last territorial government, governor and the first state governor. And I was going home <clears throat> across the, uh, the, the greens out, outside of the Capitol, and Bill Quinn was going home and going the other way. So he said, Sam, Sam. I knew him. He said, you want to be a district judge, a, a circuit judge? I said, well, let me get back to you. And he said, well, I need to know pretty soon. I said, well, I got to ask my wife first and then I'll get back to you. So we talked it over and I told him yes, Monday morning. You flirted with um, public office, didn't you? <laughs> well, I got involved with politics, of course, because my father was involved in politics. Back before I had become a judge, I ran as a, for the House, and I didn't get elected, but we elected three Republicans. So <clears throat> then when I was a judge, when I came up for reappointment, he appointed me again. <clears throat> so then I decided to run against him. <laughs> <laughs> But he wasn't going to run. It was going to be Tom Gill. When I left the court and announced for governor, uh, he, he ran. How important to you was it to be governor? Well, I thought there were important things that had to be done, but I knew the world wasn't going to come to an end. I don't believe government does everything for you anyway. So what they do is the, the, the whole purpose of government is to keep the place safe and take care of the little people. You know, it seems as though you're, you were very comfortable with the role of judge. W was there any, um, anything that really taxed you or was very challenging along the way? Well, I, I, I always had a hard time with criminal cases because I'm, I'm very... I'm very doubtful about the criminal system and the putting people in jails and one thing or another. I haven't come up with a better solution. But uh, so when I went senior, I said no more criminal cases. Because you have sentenced plenty of people to prison. Yeah. Did you ever experience threats on your life, or did you start looking behind you and locking no, the doors no, and? No. There's nothing much they can do to work up a, a hatred of the judge. The judge is only doing what the law says. Mm -hmm. As I always told them, the guards, they said the people you got to guard are not the jury and the judge, but the witnesses. In 1997, King was approached by University of Hawaii professor of trust law, Randall Roth, with a draft of an essay for publication. It harshly criticized the trustees of Bishop Estate Kamehameha Schools and fanned the flames of a scandal that would drive the trustees from office and lead to a wave of reform. He asked me what I thought. I said, well, yeah, it's good stuff, but uh, it won't go very far if you're the only person putting it out. And he said, well, will you join with me? I said, well, I have to ask my wife first. <laughs> and she said, absolutely. So I said, yes, I will. But I said, just you and me are not enough. Well, he said, who else do you recommend? I said, well, 
Gladys Brandt. And she said, you know Sam King's with you? And she said, yes, she said, count me in. Because she was already trying to do something. And she said, and I'm gonna bring in Monsignor Kekamanu, who also was involved in the ongoing problem. And then a little later, he called and said, well, Walter Heen has been suggested. Oh, I said, that would be beautiful. He was head of the Democratic Party, I was head of the Republican Party. So, and so the idea was to present this very credible group of people with stature in the community. Yes. The five of us got together and went through this, edited it, so forth, so forth, and then said, let's get it published. And we knew Randy had an ongoing relationship with our little advertiser, but they weren't ready to print it. They had to change this and they had to do that and so forth. So we went to the bulletin and they printed it the next day. Makes you glad there's a two newspaper town. Yeah. Dave Shapiro, who said yeah. your essay, your joint essay, was a bare-knuckled attack on a powerful institution. It was. But the reason we got out there was because the Kamehameha Ohana had already marched on the trustees for similar reasons. And it had all been started by Nona Bima who printed the first letter that complained about it. Your essay and the work of others before you triggered enormous investigations. That's right. Prosecution. Yes. And did it go far enough? One of the problems was that the Supreme Court was appointing the trustees. And it became pretty obvious that they were picking people for, without going into enough publicity and public input. But the present system is unstable. Uh, the Supreme Court could take it back or the probate court could say, well, I'm not going to bother with all this nonsense. What's a better idea? Turn it into a not-for-profit corporation with, trust, with directors elected by the Ohana or a majority of them. Why do you think that's not happening? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Kamehameha will... Everything has to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> Kamehameha points out that um, after all of that happened and the trustees were... The, the trustees departed, they've really amped up their education outreach. They're doing a lot more things. They're more responsive. They went out and uh, got a hold of folks who had been cut off by uh, the previous trustee system and the, they were welcomed back in. And so there's a rejuvenation and a new direction. And um, I think a lot of people at the school say, why dwell on this? Why, why, let's, let's not worry about well, making the past people accountable. I don't know what, but... Uh, <clears throat> And I suppose there's something, there's an honor in being a bishop of state trustee, which would not apply to a person who was a director of a not-for-profit corporation. Mm -hmm. But every provision of Princess Hawaii's will has been violated. Her will says there should be two schools, one for boys, one for girls. Well, there's one school although they call them the community of schools, probably a good idea. But, you know, that's not what Will said. Then she said they should be taught the basic uh, reading, writing, arithmetic. Well, they're a college preparatory school. So we're the, the ones we've done at the bottom. Now, it is true that wills that uh, passed for Elamazine purposes over a period of years change because times change but her will has not been changed and the the one way you can get it a little wider is with a not-for-profit corporation as robert midkiff has pointed out but of course then you won't have these individuals who are call themselves i'm a trustee <laughs> you heard uh what uh former trustee henry peters comment was about the, all of the work that you did with, with your partners on this. He said, oh, the group of Hawaiians who wrote Broken Trust are country club, high muckety-muck Hawaiians. Well, I, I, his most famous saying that I know of is, 
if I if I did the things they wrote about in the book, I should be in jail. And my answer to that is I agree with him. What were they violated every provision of the trust law that they could. It was a, I think it was referred to as a personal investment club atmosphere. Yeah, well, they had they were investing in the same things as the trust, which is a no, no, and they kept that all in a secret safe. There's a lot that hasn't come out about what happened in those days, isn't there? A lot of sealed pages. Well, there pages. can only be so much of the book, you know. If if that book, how many pages are there? Three hundred something, including the index. If it were a thousand pages, nobody would read it. <laughs> Roy Benham had a very interesting quote yes. in your book. He said, you know, when Hawaiians are funny in a way that if you waste their money, you steal their money, they let that go, but you try to hurt their children and watch. That's what happened, especially to eliminating the outreach program. They fired people in two weeks for no, said they didn't have the money. What do you mean they didn't have the money? They had plenty of money. When you, you know, you've gotten some distance now, when you look back and you see what was done in those times at the old estate, what was the worst thing the trustees did? The worst thing they did was to run it as a personal, personal uh, property. Raise their fees, they were getting a million dollars a piece. They said, well, the law permitted it. Well, there was a provision in law that limited the amount of fees that a trust could take, but overriding the whole thing is the law of trusts, which says you don't get paid more than you are worth. And not a one of them was worth what they were getting paid. Only trustee Oswald Stender emerged from the Fuhrer with his good reputation intact. At the time, the Bishop Estate Endowment Fund was estimated at $10 billion, and its trustee appointments were paying nearly a million dollars a year. In 2006, Judge King and Randall Roth, the UH professor specializing in trust law, followed up the newspaper essay with a book titled Broken Trust, Greed, Mismanagement, and Political Manipulation at America's Largest Charitable Trust. Today, King maintains a watchful eye. More recently, I saw in the paper where they said they were going to help the homeless. There's nothing like that in her will. Maybe as a not-for-profit corporation, they could do that, tie it onto something, but you know. So you still don't think they're going the right direction? They don't seem to be aware of what they're doing. It's all right with me. I'm not, I'm not going to heckle them anymore, but. And that's what your book shows. It shows the, uh, the degree to which um, the power structure was interlocked with the old Bishop of State yes. trustees. Put it, get it away from the courts by having a not-for-profit corporation where it has directors appointed, elected by the ohana, by the graduates. You think that'll happen in your lifetime? No. <laughs> think it'll happen ever? Well, I don't know. It should. The, the one force that could handle it would be the IRS, which says you're not carrying out the provisions of your trust. You know, your book has created a sensation in trust uh, circles, you know, trust lawyers. I mean, you've gotten a very prestigious award, and so has Randy Roth. Um, you know, they considered a Bible of what not to do. Running a, a, an organization like that is a feudal empire. Do you think it's gotten the attention and the um, action it deserves in Hawaii? I don't know. I, I, I haven't followed up on that. But it is true that we got told by the <clears throat> University of Hawaii that a college had ordered several hundred books direct from them. I don't know what they're going to do with them, but 
somebody thinks it's useful for some purpose. You've been in Hawaii working in the trenches and, and seeing the corridors of power for a very long time. Um, when you look at what you know and what you think may be ahead, what's your vision of the future? Are we doing all We're right? We're going to be more and more influenced by California, both by people and by law. So eventually, that's why I, I, I'm really a backer of OHA, because that's one place where they can protect the future for our Hawaiians. And I interpret Hawaiian as a real Hawaiians, not like me, uh, what I have, 316, oh no. I got an eighth for my mother and a 16th for my father, 316ths. I'm not talking about myself, although emotionally I'm with them. And naturally I'm an official of the federal government too. So you see OHA as being an institution that can't yes. be touched. Yes. Except um, there are a lot, of, a lot of people who want to see those entitlements go. Yes. There always are. <laughs> I mean, if, if, we, if we're talking about a bunch of goodies going to be given to a bunch of people of which I'm not a member, well, then I'm opposed to it. And you're still vigilant, hoping Kamehameha Schools changes its governance. Oh, they're, they're okay. I'm not spending any time losing sleep over it. I think they're spending more time opposing the idea than I am promoting it. When's the last time you lost sleep worrying about something? I guess it was between Sunday and Wednesday when I was going to call Annie. She said, ask me again Wednesday. So between Sunday and Wednesday, I lost a little sleep. When you didn't know whether your intended right. wanted to marry you. Right. She kept him guessing for a few days. Now in his 90s, Judge Samuel King continues to preside over federal court cases in Hawaii and California. I'd like to thank Judge King for sharing his stories with us. And thank you for visiting our website, emailing us with comments and suggestions, and for joining me each week for conversations on Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Till next time, ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition. It's in Sony's DNA. What were your family names in Hawaiian? Family names? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My, I'm the only one done to have a recorded Hawaiian name. Uh, my sister Charlotte is Charlotte Lelepoki. And then my two brothers, and the youngest sister is Navahini Okalai. And in between is my two brothers, Evans Paliku Kana'i Puni and Davis Maliola Keavia Heolu. You said you don't have a recorded Hawaiian name. Do you have a nickname? Kalani Holomoki Kai. <laughs> <laughs>